Uh, we yes. have it going okay, sir. And all the Get girls are here. You're, you're going well, good, buddy. I, 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 I am waiting. More of the folks over there to come over here. Can you come over here? To make it more warm. Bring a chair. Okay. If you want your own chair, at least bring it there. It's very hard for me. Let's have some warmth and love. and Here, we got a pro. We got a pro. No, grab that corner. It's not there, man. It's not impossible to sit Settle down, class. Settle down. No, no, that's no not good. chewing gum. Hey, if buddy. If you do, I hope you brought enough hey, for everybody. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, four, the three, phone. two, phone. one. Welcome, welcome very much to, to, uh, to ACAP. This is April 1 of the year 2013, and we're pleasured to have a number of people here to listen to the words of Sarah Flounder. She's right. been on the scene in terms of activist uh, criticism, particularly of American foreign policy. She has a great long-term association with that giant of an American intellectual, Ramsey Clark. She's been with him from the beginning, almost, from the International Action Center. And she's a very, very smart cookie. She has a great ability to write very clearly and make things clear. She's going to address this, I think, tonight. I don't want to take... Uh, set the stage for you, but she's taking the 10th anniversary of our invasion of Iraq as a theme that she asked us to read about. So let's give Sarah Flound, well, I mentioned to people, if I may, on the stream, it's just a webcam coming, so just listen in and join in, but uh, so it's not as good or bad as you can, but we are videotaping it for YouTube. Let's welcome Sarah Flounders, uh, media a presenter and uh, intellectual extraordinaire, if I say so myself. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that very warm introduction. And uh, hopefully tonight will be mainly a uh, discussion. And I was asked to uh, speak about the this being the 10th anniversary of the war in Iraq. Article and some material based on that. So it's it's a time to kind of recount where we're at, uh, ten years after shock and awe. Yeah. Now, I think we should really begin with talking about the criminal role of the corporate media, because this is a media gathering, and the importance of alternative media and alternative media information. Uh, is never clearer than when we look back and we see the absolute criminal conspiracy uh, of lies that were pitched. The uh, director of the I hope I didn't lose my train of thought there. But um, the, the lies that are, are pitched 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the lead up to the war in Iraq, I think we could see that for months and months beforehand. The story, the story relentlessly, was that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Every commentator, every politician had to begin with answering what they would want to do about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Iraq as a nuclear threat, Iraq's germ warfare program, yellow cake uranium. Uh, the stories went on and on and on, including testimony to the UN and testimony to Congress. And all of it, all of it turned out to be a total fabrication. So 10 years in, you would think that the corporate media, if they were going to evaluate this at all, would examine their own role. Uh, but it's just slopped off. There was some misinformation. There were some over-projections. And yet, absolutely terrible crime was committed against an entire people. Iraq was totally laid waste uh, by the most modest calculations of the order of the population ended up dead, dismembered, disabled, or dislocated. Uh, in other words, refugees, more than five million refugees, uh, hundreds of thousands of people with disabilities, more than a million deaths, both from immediate impact of war, but also what happens when you shut down hospitals, when the entire situation is so dangerous, when there's no medicine, when there's no way to go 
across town even to, to look in on seniors. Um, Iraq went from having the highest educational and literacy level in the entire region to today having the lowest. Uh, and that is a theft of the future. It's a theft of, of childhood, but it also means the next generation. So this is a crime committed against the people of Iraq. Uh, and, and just the week of the 10th anniversary, there was a major article uh, in the London Guardian and also on the BBC, uh, a very important video, which talked about what was called the Salvador Option and how Colonel Steele, uh, as a way of pushing back the Iraqi resistance, as a real calculated policy, began the policy of the death squads, fomenting civil war, creating crime of one people against another, using mass torture and assassination as an actual tactic, reporting directly to General Petraeus. This, this shouldn't be forgotten, and you should really look at who, this. Who is this, you say? The BBC, the BBC did a whole story, and also the London Guardian, uh, really exposing the U.S. role in fomenting the Civil War, the death squads, the assassination teams, the torture teams in Iraq during the most horrible years of oppression as a way to crush the Iraqi resistance. So there's both the immediate loss of life that the U.S. is responsible for in shock and awe. That very concept, it's a military concept, to, so, to hit um, an opponent so uh, hard in the most fundamental way, the entire civilian population, that any resistance becomes impossible. And that is what the U.S. in their arrogance thought they would be able to do to Iraq. Now, if we look back 10 years later, we would say, by every calculation, this was a total disaster, a total failure of U.S. strategic plans. It was a harrowing experience for Iraq, but the fact is it failed in terms of U.S. conquest. That the plan for 14 permanent bases for a huge uh, U.S. embassy that was supposed to have 10,000 people and food supplies for three years. That's not an embassy, that's a, a base. All those plans collapse. The hundred orders that were to be left permanently in place by El Paul Bremer, remember who first came in, totally did away with all Iraqi laws and legislation and ordered complete privatization, free market uh, relations in the Iraqi economy. Even when they had a parliament that the U.S. themselves had put in place, we wouldn't go along with this. Uh, they refused, the, this Iraqi parliament that the U.S. helped put in place refused to go along with a status of forces agreement, which would mean that U.S. troops could never be charged by the Iraqi government. So on every count, it was a real, U.S. troops couldn't stay. The more than 1.1 million U.S. soldiers, and uh, probably almost an equal number of, of contractors, but U.S. soldiers, that those counts are actually served in Iraq during those years, uh, along with hundreds of thousands of other, quote, NATO members. 40% of those 1.1 million U.S. soldiers who served, we hear today from the VA, from studies, 40% will suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. That's a harrowing toll. So it means that the toll is, is much, much higher than the 4,400 deaths and the many, many disabled. Uh, it really uh, means about half a million disabled uh, soldiers coming back, scarred for life. So these are the figures that we should keep in mind 10 years out. The U.S. lies, the corporate media lies, who acts really as a public relations arm for U.S. military mm -hmm. corporations. That's really the way in which they function. There's another thing that we shouldn't forget because when history is rewritten, uh, and that's something that uh, corporate power is all about doing, 
uh, always rewriting history, what's been completely forgotten is the powerful movement of 10 years ago. The millions and millions of people that were in the streets. The millions of people who, dis despite 24-7 war propaganda and endless lies, refused to accept and opposed very deeply and demonstrated again and again in hundreds of thousands, ha half a million to a million people here in the streets of New York. Do you remember February 2003 and, and January in D.C.? Ten million huge outpourings. Uh, there were some 3,000 demonstrations around the world in that lead up to the war. Now, I actually had an opportunity to be in Iraq just before the U.S. invasion. It was a terrible time because everyone in Iraq knew this war was coming and there was nothing they could do to stop it. There was no agreement, there was nothing that they could accommodate. And the banner page, even of the <coughs> um, English language publications, and what was even on billboards, you see, it, it means if the U.S. strategists hadn't been so arrogant, they would have gotten this message themselves. But what was written, I remember this even in the English language newspapers of Baghdad Daily, was what the jungles were to Vietnam, our cities will be to us. That was an open declaration of resistance. The government gave out six months of food subsidy in advance with the message a resistance fighter. There was open training uh, in both handling of military arms and how to make um, these um, unexploded devices that can be set up. IEDs. Uh, so all of this uh, was done publicly and openly. Anyone who was watching, but the arrogance was that the U.S. weapons are so powerful that no one could stand in the way. That resistance would be impossible and that the population would throw flowers and cheer or at least kneel and submit. And neither thing happened. So it's important today when we look at new U.S. wars being threatened. And I really want to move to that because just in this past week, as part of the war games in Korea, a step that the Pentagon has never done. They flew, uh, which is a plane that usually carries nuclear weapons, B-52s, from Missouri, 6,500 miles to South Korea to do test runs to send a message to the North. Now, we need to remember what U.S. war did in Korea, because this was a war that, where there wasn't a huge opposition in Vietnam, so it often gets forgotten that more than three million Koreans were killed in the Korean War, and more bombs were dropped on the north by the U.S. than were dropped in all of World War II in a small country, but not one bombing target was left because they said there's not one bridge not one building more than two stories left in the country. So today, when the North ex expresses absolute determination to resist any more war games, any threats to their sovereignty, it's coming out of that experience of before and reminding the U.S. that the first war of this era that they really, you could say, lost, ended in a draw, did not succeed in, was the Korean War. So this is important for us to, to keep in mind. And I, I want to address it also from the point of view of who's charged criminal in these wars. You know, here's, here's a media which plays a role that's absolutely full of lies and slander. And then President Bush, who ordered the war, but take somebody like Colonel Steele, who it's later proved is actually responsible for the death squad and the mass killings. Reporting to General Petraeus, where's, where is the responsibility? Who's been charged? <laughs> Private Bradley Manning. <laughs> That's who's been charged. With crimes, really, that could lead to the death penalty. 
I mean, we just have to think about the very one who helped to expose the depth of the crime and the video of the diplomatic behavior is the only one who today really stands charged from that war. Right. So he's the only it, patriot, man of country. That, that, and and his action. I mean, some of that video footage, if, if you've seen it, uh, helicopter gunships just blowing away reporters, the Reuters news team wasted. You hear the 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 talk back and forth among the helicopter pilots laughing about uh, as they carry out what's a massacre. And this has become the U.S. policy today, that, that U.S. wars are so unpopular internationally, but also domestically. And it is what is driving the drone policy. So I really want to address what the drones are and why it's suddenly all the talk and all the hope of the Pentagon, and they're pumping millions and hundreds of tens of billions of dollars into programs for drones. Drones that are as small as a, a dragonfly and is, of course as large as um, stealth bombers with all kinds of names of, of killer drones. <coughs> Predators and all of, all of the names that they're calling them. Uh, but the drones are really the hope, the expectation of the U.S. government is that they can carry out assassinations and hits anywhere in the world, cost-free, against utterly defenseless populations. And it has become, they're so enraptured with this new weapon that here's an example just in New York City, Mayor Bloomberg is giving uh, $300 million in real estate and a hundred million dollars of our tax money at the very time that schools and hospitals are closing to the Israeli Institute of Technology to build a major drones weapons facility right here in New York City. Oh my God. So this is an outrage by any standard. This is Technion, which is being built right here in New York City, all under the, the great promise that New York is going to go high tech and attract very exciting jobs. Uh, but really what it is, is money given to a weapons facility that now makes drones uh, to be used against Palestinians, to be used as um, earth moving, robotic earth movers in the West Bank, as, as stealth drones, as mechanized uh, worms that, that try to destroy the tunnels into, into Gaza, which, which supply really life-saving, uh, really sustenance. This is what Technion does. And, and here you have Mayor Bloomberg giving city funding. And it gets worse. Where is this huge facility going to be? What's today the site of a Goldwater called Long Term Care Hospital on Roosevelt Island? Where? Roosevelt Island. Roosevelt Island. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, Goldwater uh. Hospital is a New York City public hospital for long term care. Many, many disabled immigrants are there. People, there are more people actually on respirators at Goldwater Hospital than I think any hospital in the country. Their plan for Goldwater is to send those immigrants home. Now you can picture being a disabled immigrant dependent on a respirator suddenly dumped in some small poor village that you escaped. From the <laughs> a job. It's it's a horror. It's a horror. Uh, and and so again, it's like cuts from the poorest, cuts from those most in need of public facilities, and giving it for the manufacture of a new weapons facility. Uh, so Technion, Technion, I want to say about Technion because until this facility is built. Google, and it does show the corporate interactions of, in high tech today, nice little Google, uh, right over here in the West Village, is giving Technion 22,000 square feet of space to begin their campus. 
all these have such nice, clean names, don't they? They build them on campus. Giving them? Yes, they're giving them 22,000 square feet of space at 15th Street and 8th Avenue. And, and we're actually um, having a discussion at the Solidarity Center tomorrow night on how to make this uh, a real struggle, take on Technion, because April is called Anti-Drone Month. Uh, and so the idea is let's really begin to take on Technion, take on this criminal deal with a major weapons manufacturer, handouts to the weapons manufacturers, cutbacks in hospitals and schools right here. Uh, because unless this crime is exposed, it goes, you see there's no publicity for this, whereas there's endless publicity to how we consider the people of Korea. Right? So, I also, um, just in closing, and then I want to very much hope we can open up the floor for discussion and comments, address what the war has meant domestically. Um, a war that, by every measure, um, they now say that the war in Iraq costs more than, in terms of also long-term care, the hidden expenses, the borrowing expenses, more than $3 trillion. If you can even, I don't think anyone can wrap their head around these numbers. Three trillion? Three trillion dollars. <laughs> um, it, it's beyond it's beyond belief for a war that uh, people in the US were told would be cost free, that Iraqi oil would pay for it all. <laughs> I remember those stories, meaning we, well we planned to steal uh, and it was a theft that was carried out by huge, huge corruption on a massive by the U.S. own estimates about $10 billion just went missing in Iraq. Yeah. Unaccounted for. Uh, the Hadley Burton so, was trading at $12 a share in 2002, then after the invasion went up to $80 a share. That's, that's exactly. And that's who, when win or lose in these wars, even when they're devastating failures, even by U.S. imperialist policy standards, there are major corporations profit enormously. And we pay, there's, there's there. and the soldiers who are sent pay, and now the drone attacks pay. Now, I want to say, I, I, I wanted to wind up on this. I had an opportunity to be a couple months ago in the stand uh, to speak for the release, the repatriation of the uh, political prisoner, Dr. Afiyas who was a Pakistani citizen who was among the thousands and thousands of people who they, they talked about kidnappings, targeted assassinations. People were rounded up around the world uh, in, in kidnappings, put in secret detention. Uh, and, and this is now admitted. I mean, you know, Guantanamo was just the tip of the iceberg. Dr. Afia Siddiqui was one of those uh, people, a very prominent, uh, Pakistani woman who was educated in the U.S. at Brandeis, MIT, uh, had a doctorate in psychology in early childhood education and learning. She, along with her three children, was kidnapped in Pakistan 10 years ago and was missing for five years. And when this became a huge rallying cry and a call for her release, as it was reported again and again, it was the U.S. holding her at Bagram, her mix which was U.S. based. Um, she was suddenly dumped on the side of a road in Afghanistan, picked up by uh, some Afghan troops. The expectation was she would be shot on, on sight. But at any rate, she was shot by U.S. soldiers. She survived and was brought for trial in New to New York City five years ago. She was held in complete solitary confinement for a year. And, uh, her case is important. Uh, I'm going into it for just a minute here because it's such an outrage to the people in Pakistan that this has now become the daughter of a nation, the most widely followed What's her name? figure, Afia Siddiqui, Dr. Afia Siddiqui. Put on trial in New York City. Afia, uh, Afia Siddiqui? Siddiqui. Siddiqui. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a very important petition and information on the International Action Center's website, iacenter.org slash Siddiqui petition. 
and you can go online and, and see this call for her repatriation. So she was charged not with terrorism when she was put on trial here, um, but with attempting to shoot U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan. So here you have a Pakistani woman kidnapped in Pakistan, Pakistani citizen, kidnapped in Pakistan, held in Afghanistan, and then suddenly brought to New York City for trial. Now, on these charges, no U.S. soldier, absolutely no one, was injured whatsoever except for Dr. Abiy Siddiqui. She had three shots in the abdomen, <laughs> and her inside were really ripped up. Um, so even though no one was injured, and they could not even present, even at a show trial, that had all this publicity, a fingerprint, a bullet casing, or any evidence she'd ever fired a weapon. And there was no one, as I say, injured. She was sentenced to 86 years. Oh. And is being held in the Carswell prison in Texas, the same prison where Lynn Stewart. What's the name of the prison? Carswell prison in Texas. Carswell? So I want to I wanna actually segue into Apia Siddiqui and Lynn Stewart talking Thank about you. what repression here at home uh, means and repression around the world because this U.S. war in Afghanistan and in Iraq was not only a war in those countries, it was thousands of people rounded up around the world as part of this quote war on terror, secret detention, secret prisons around the world. Even in Guantanamo, by U.S. own estimates, uh, 2% of all the people held, did they have any evidence on at all? So you have a 98% failure rate uh, in Guantanamo, which was their top prison. So you can just picture what all these other secret prisons are holding. Um, but I got into this by saying that I had an opportunity to go to Pakistan. And here you, I was, it was one huge rally after another, day after day after day. During the eight days, I traveled there with former Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney. Mm -hmm. uh, and two months before that, Ramsey Clark had gone. There had been a whole number of delegations calling for Dr. Afia Siddiqui's release. And you could see everywhere on billboards, spray painted on walls, in the thousands of people, tens of thousands of people who turned out at these rallies calling for the release of this brilliant young woman uh, who was, as I say, kidnapped with her children. Does the Pakistani um, government uh Go along with that? Well, a lot of this was a campaign to press the Pakistani government to demand obvious Siddiqui's release because they were complicit in this, They're, as they are complicit in the U.S. drone wars and are recipients of many tens of millions of dollars of U.S. military aid. So, yes, so like the, the Pakistani government, government so the, the demonstrations are now, at this point, every political party, right, left, religious, secular, uh, is also calling for the release of Dr. Obvious. So it's an important campaign because it's the other side. You know, uh, U.S. military planners can think, just like shock and awe, it's cost-free. There'll be no impact. Or picking up people around the world, there'll be no impact. And yet it is creating an enormous rage, outrage, anger at the policymakers who decide life and death from behind a console in a drone attack, or who pick people up around the world, hold them for years. <coughs> when two of Dr. Abiy Siddiqui's children were returned to the family after five years and after seven years, the son and then the daughter, they were then speaking only English. So it's a question, it's pretty obvious where they were held and, and the uh, conditions. Now, as I say, Dr. Siddiqui is being held in Texas at the same prison where Lynn Stewart is, a well-known, much-loved attorney right here in New York City who was just for decades known in every prominent case, outspoken, um, such, a, such a courageous individual. Yeah, charged outrageously for issuing a press release, a press statement, uh, for her client, uh, who was the called the blind Sheikh, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Rahman. Um, 
Now, for this crime, for this crime, she was charged, prosecuted, sentenced to two years, and then a superior court said, well, that's not heavy enough. They did what has not happened in the U.S. history before, to send uh, a prisoner back for a higher sentence. They demanded the judge <laughs> sentence her to a higher sentence. Sometimes a, a, a higher court will overrule the lower court to um, clemency or a lower sentence, but a higher sentence that's unprecedented <coughs> was done in Lynn Stewart's case, and she was sentenced to 10 years at the age of 72. Uh, the cancer that she had been battling has returned, and she is now in prison suffering stage four cancer that spread to her lungs, back, and, and is an extremely dangerous situation. So uh, this is another part of the war at home, the thousands of people who've been swept up here in the US, and including people like Lynn Stewart, an attorney who took so many cases pro bono, took cases just out of the justice and rightness of the cases. Uh, and I think demanding her release, there's a whole campaign now calling for uh, compassionate release for Lynn Stewart. Uh, just to show you the actual cynicism of the U.S. prison system, they did respond. Thousands and thousands of emails, messages, letters were sent. And uh, the federal prison system responded, which is very unusual. It's important. That's a step in itself that they even recognize the existence of this campaign. But they responded by saying that by their calculation, Lynn Stewart could still live 18 months to two years, and that uh, until the, it's eight months or less, compassionate release would not be considered. Oh, yeah. now, now, is this a kind <laughs> of... Oh, 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 And yeah, it, it does show you the kind of system that we're up against, the largest prison system in the world by any measure, and the most, in every calculated way, absolutely heartless. Largest number of people held in solitary confinement anywhere in the world. Largest number of people on death row. And that's the other side of the wars abroad coming home here at home. A prison population that is spiraling oh. 10 times the size of any other country. It's part of final cutbacks. Three out, no hope of parole. So let me, let me end with those notes because I think that's. Three strikes are out, no hope of parole. Uh, and I think we're, getting, we're getting some feedback, so I'm going to take the time to cut this. No hope of parole. The ghost. The ghost in the ghost. I thought it's on the live stream. I see. No. And how, how long was that? I should have a. Yeah, yeah. I told you. 33 minutes so far, you're doing great. What? So I have a question. I want to comment. I got a question here. Uh, Everybody speak up if you can. Yeah, okay. yeah. My question is, uh, uh, do you think that all of this is going to, uh, in a direct way, turn inward on the citizens of this country? Is it going to end up being... Uh, uh, are, are we all going to be, dis is there going to be insane uh, factions fighting each other? I mean, I hear that everybody upstate is armed to the teeth, by the way. You know, and I hear this from women. Everybody's getting armed upstate and in Pennsylvania. Getting what? Armed. Weapons. People are armed. Well, they're getting poisoned by chemtrails in the air and pesticides in the ground and fluoride in the water. Pseudo-medicines. But I mean, what I'm, what I'm wondering is, you know, there's this big story about FEMA buying uh, 400, 400 million hollow point bullets and another million and a half, uh, For the 150 population. million uh, bullets of another kind. What's, I mean, is, are, they, are they planning to decimate the population of the U.S.? Are they... Is this all going to be uh, American Some against American? Uh, <laughs> well, the devil uh, it's an important question. Is it turning inward? 
And it's true, the war has yeah. come home. This was something very important, especially this week. It's the anniversary of the death of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. uh, and his great warning was on the Vietnam War. The war has come home. That the bombs that fall in Vietnam fall in US cities. And it's more so true today, 45 years later, than it was even in his time. Because the wars are larger. The more pervasive, the military budget is far, far larger. Um, and the pervasive impact of the military into every police unit and into the culture is, is far greater. Uh, is it a done deal? I don't think by a long shot, because the wars that, that people automatically would salute in an earlier time today overwhelmingly what's what is the driving thing for drones because they feel they you know can no longer send u.s soldiers out to fight these wars so it is driving a new kind of technology extremely dangerous we should be aware but it it shows it's a real struggle it shows it's a real struggle but yes the wars turn inward and we're in an empire which is in serious decay decline and decay, and, and we need to be aware of that, that they can no longer just bail out the banks and take it all from lobbying the programs here. Yeah, I, I, I add something to this gentleman's observation about ammo. I belong to a West Side Rifle and Pistol Club. I go there for target practice. I mean, the last week, Normally I buy ammo from a shop in Long Island, but I ran out of ammo, so they sell ammo. It's a 22 long rifle ammo, the most common ammo ever, the 22 long rifle bullet. You can manufacture that something like 100 in one second. I mean, it's so cheap to manufacture. They said, I'm sorry, I don't have a single box of ammo. I said, what? You don't have a single box of 22 rifle ammo? which you used to okay. sell by the dozens. He says, yeah, I, I, simply we do not know where to procure it from. And we, we got connections oh, oh. as a rifle club. We got connections which you wouldn't even know. And it is no ammo available, not only the 22 long rifle, the .357 Magnums, the .45s, there's, we, we got no ammo. There, because I was a member of so long, and I said, look, so I, you want me to go back home? So somehow the other, he came up with two boxes and charged me an exorbitant price for a 22. There's not a single bullet, 22 long rifle, right? the most common bullet ever. There's not a single bullet available in New York City. New York City is at the house of, the home of the liberals. Forget Montana and Arizona. In New York City, you don't get bullets. Why in New York City? I don't know. I can't answer that one, but I, I see um, Beth here with her hand. Yeah. Speak up, Beth, if you can. Okay. Um, I get criticized for being so down on U.S. foreign policy with some family members. And they say, but we're the good guys. Don't you realize we defeated the Nazis, and I'm saying, with what's going on now, if you're paying attention, the Nazis look like Boy Scouts. In comparison, the damage, the destruction, the hate that we are generating, and I'm so ashamed. I'm a proud American. I believe in the ideals that you know people come here thinking this is the land of the free. And I've been saying for quite a while, you know, free to eat out of a garbage can if you're hungry enough. You know, just, just think how, how devastating, how painful for us. I bet everybody in this room would be, you know, a, a proud American working to do whatever you can to um, make things better in your community, to, to do good things, to spread the word. We're on cable access trying to promote, you know, 
good things that happened. One good thing that Obama was reelected, and this is indisputably the voice of the people, which is often neutered. <coughs> All the attempts to keep people from voting, the gerrymandering, the manipulation, you know, and trying to keep people from voting, enough of them overcame the zillions of dollars that were to promote um, the Republican uh, agenda. It failed. I, I would disagree. The Republican Democrat agenda is the same. Obama is drinking the Kool Aid. He drinks the, We're for the Jill party, Dr. Jill Stein, and uh, the Green Party, and even their political party falls apart. I don't know. I remember January 15th is Martin Luther King's birthday, and I was in front of the UN in 1991, passing out candles and prayers for Iraq before the invasion of the first Persian Gulf War. And uh, George Bush, you know, orchestrated that whole multinational thing in a ruse. And, uh, you know, and it just created a, a disaster. And these, these trigger-happy people want to play with their firecrackers and, you know, and blow off their bombs in you know, Iraq and Afghanistan and whatever. They just have a crop launch budget. The, the, the Department of Defense is out of control. I figure we don't even have a government. We have pirates. We have a gangster syndicate in office that is doing their thing and selling out to their corporate loophole, uh, profit-minded people with no recognition of Mother Earth. I'm Pachamama Alliance. Mother Earth is a living thing. Gaia is a breathing creature in the universe. The planet is our planet. And resources, the blood belongs inside the body. We need our minerals, our oils. Gas is over, drilling is over, fracking is over. All those fossil fuel things, you know, we have eco-friendly energy. Germany's on board. Fukushima disaster two years ago. They shut down the nuclear plants and slapped solar powers and fill on panels everywhere. Brazil taught us about methane. Iceland taught us about how to, on top of the government. People are intelligent and moving. We've got this criminal syndicate. We know it from 9-11 truth. The obvious <coughs> new face ridiculousness of these people who stole the election in 2000 and continue with their malfeasance with a pretty face like Obama. Excuse me, no, he's a drone wizard killing people on a regular basis. He's not black. I wish he was. Cynthia McKinney is a good woman. You know, it doesn't matter if you're black or white, but it matters that you, you honor and respect people and love life and respect life is they kill life. So we have eco-friendly energy solutions and they just insist on their profit and fossil fuel. The Pentagon will never have enough money. They're based on fear. We work with love. We have faith. You know, we have trust. Our magic work going forward is transparency. You know, accountability. That was the whole the Arab Spring and the Occupy movement in Spain and here, we were on Wall Street Beth last year. We were on the street with signs saying, we believe in freedom. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, Rachel Maddow was promoting um, hubris. Has anybody seen oh, that? Oh, it's marvelous. It's a hubris. marvelous stuff. Yeah. This is documenting, you know, the lead how, how we got into the How world. we got into it, naming names, and it should be promoted all well, over. Well, also, Dirty Wars is a wonderful film that uh, Jeremy Scahill. Uh -huh. um, oh, really? Yeah, well, this, yeah, is, is, this is brand new. And for it to be on MSNBC, it just blew me away. Uh, wow. Just to say, now, one, just to say one thing on the, on the elections. I mean, there's uh, the importance of a rejection despite huge, huge money of a completely right-wing racist agenda. But it also shows the problem that exists now in this country. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. That corporate rule and the, that the military-industrial banking complex is the all-powerful, decisive institution. And regardless of who is in that is the policies that will be served. And that you war drive the <laughs> goes, goes on. I, this is the second anniversary that happened under Obama of the complete destruction and war in Libya, a country with the highest living standards, highest educational standards in Africa, and the beginning of the war on Syria. Uh, really an all-out effort of regime change. So. The, the U.S. wars continue regardless of who is in the White House. 
I no, Jimmy Carter times. doesn't have any foreign soldier dying. He stood for diplomacy. Oh, he was really responsible for a huge, uh, on the actual building of the bases in the Gulf. Uh, but but he didn't attack Soviet true. Union or Afghanistan. He boycotted the Olympics. He didn't he didn't bomb or Iran with the hostage crisis. He believed in negotiation. He he, he said human rights in Latin America allows Ortega to, to Sandinistas to take over Samoa and Nicaragua. He, he stood for human rights and equal rights. That was the only democratic president I ever voted for, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> <laughs> he was seen as yeah. a whip. Isn't that the shameful Absolutely. thing? because he yeah, wasn't well, a warmonger. But it, it also is an understanding of what the system is that exists to create the highest level of profit for a whole of corporations. Mm -hmm. And that is the driving force. It's, it's important for us to understand it even when we look at the wars and the, the policies that come from the war and the, the building of a war machine, even when it's not Aggressively, that very moment engaged in a war. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speak up, Nate. <laughs> Go ahead. No, talk loud. Thank you very much for being here. But one question that comes to my mind, and you intoned it just a bit ago, but you see, you cannot wage war without being able to finance it. And who are the financiers and the bankers that are creating all the wars that America is doing well or not well? But who's the financial backer behind the war machines? And also... Our taxes. <laughs> no, the federal money printing uh, no, system. No, no, no. Okay, no. <laughs> yeah, Peggy. There are simply bankers that back war and governments and principalities and such things because it is profitable. Who's banking our war mongering efforts on all stages? Because why is America wanting to wage war, where does it have any business to wage war at all? Madison said, this is a contained nation. We will not have wars. Okay, who's banking our war efforts? Who's banking the drones? Who's banking, who's making available funds to even go for war machines? to make, what do you call it? term Wall Street comes in, and that means whether you're talking about Goldman Sachs or Bank of America or Chase, um, is really a handful of the largest financial institutions that have just about the same board of directors of the largest military and the largest communications industries, and they operate together. Now, what do they want to lay hold of? The federal budget is a huge, you know, multi-trillion dollar piggy bank for them, uh, a source of funds. And more than half of the military budget goes to the military. Another very substantial portion of it goes to pay back the interest on both past wars and past loans. And it is all feeding the same as how to prop up corporate power in the U.S. It does not operate in our interests. Now, that doesn't mean that people's movements have won concessions. They have. I mean, Social Security itself, unemployment insurance, 
the most basic public schools, you know, uh, the health system, bad as it is, but every one of those have come from past people's struggles where, where certain concessions were extracted. But for the most part, this entire system operates in the interests of the bankers. And the bankers and the military corporations are so tightly enmeshed that you can't separate them. Uh, and they're based right here in the US. There's always some idea that it's some uh, conspiracy somewhere else in the world. And, and we really want to look at the role right here of Washington. Uh, the, how does the IMF and the World Bank operate? It's the same consortium of banks, but also they exchange with, in terms of the Euro planners, German and British and French bankers to maximize profit. That's, that's how the capital system works. And it's relentless. It makes any kind of planning for environmental, for the long-term survival even of the planet impossible. Because every corporate CEO has one question on his mind all the time. And that is how to maximize profit this quarter. Yeah. Not, not five and 10 years down, not any kind of planning what kind of a future do we want for our children? That CEO only remains in his position if he has maximized profit, that immediate quarter. And so it makes the most relentless and, and outrageous. I mean, when you consider what fracking is, as, as how to destroy the environment, the water table, the aquifer, uh, and yet it's profitable when you talk about this pipeline coming from the tar sands in Canada, and you could read yeah. endlessly on how dangerous, how destructive it is. What drives it? Profit. And there are many, many more reasonable solutions, whether it's on the environment, or there are many <coughs> solutions that are profitable, but not as profitable, such as free health care and education for all. Uh, but the drive to maximize profit right here, every single instant, is what drives this system and is really sending them over the edge and trying to pull us, the population, with them. So I, I think it's important to, to look at what the, the banking, military, and, and media uh, corporations are. Media is a big, big, major industry. I see Frank has sent that he cut in, but you had uh, too many times. What are you going to say? No, I simply want to ask Ms. Flanders, and I'm so proud of you and thankful for going to Iraq and Afghanistan and visiting these countries. Uh, I understood it may be true or false uh, that um, I heard that before the war in 2003, Saddam Hussein, president of Iraq, uh, swore he would uh, buy a million cars a year from Detroit if they didn't invade. He was sort of like desperate to, say, to stop this war and eminent invasion, preemptive strike on his land. And was that true or not? Did you hear anything about that? Um, <coughs> I know that many, many, many concessions, huge concessions were offered. Uh, actually going along even with the sanctions which were starvation for the Iraqi people, agreeing to UN inspectors which were relentless. Every single industry in Iraq was under minute 24-hour video surveillance. Yeah, Every Dennis industry. Halliday gave him his position at the UN because it was discussed that many of the arms inspectors said there's no weapons there's, of mass there's destruction. There's actually no, no weapons at all. As a matter of fact, there's no industry. Uh, it's all been shut down. So, so Iraq made many, many offers of concessions. What did the U.S. with the invasion hope to change? And that was Iraq had nationalized the oil, and they wanted to be the decision makers of how to use that oil to develop Iraq. And, and that was not a decision that oh, even that even Saddam Hussein or anyone in Iraq could just dismiss and give up because it had been won in a revolutionary upheaval and the oil had been nationalized. So the, the, the planning of the corporate 
and the military strategist was just smash the entire government, just destroy everything and go in carte blanche like Elf Wall, Bremers, um, 100 orders to just do Five away with every protection in Iraq, right. privatize everything. When the U.S. invasion in 2003 Bush. under Bush happened, um, Crystal. that was the, I, the idea behind it, that they could just remake Iraq. And in that, they completely Jamie. failed. They, 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 they really did. No, there's one more thing. It's not only the nationalization of the oil industry. Saddam Hussein started accepting payments in the euro. That's right. That, is that right. was a big blow for foreign currency reserves. Yeah. And that's yeah. why they're yeah. rattling around. It's trading yeah, in that's, Europe. That's very true. What is it that they want to destroy in, in Iran? Because Iran is willing to sell oil to any and every country and trade with any and every country. Uh, same with Venezuela. Same right. with Venezuela. What what is it they want to destroy? They want to reprivatize. When we say recolonize, reconquer the world, they want the arrangements that existed at the turn of the century, the last century, to the 1950s and 60s, Banking. where they Banking could control. go in at will and pay pennies on the dollar. And it was totally U.S. industries that were... were no, the oil companies pay taxes, I heard that they did, but when I was told, no, they do. It's, it's not very much. It, it's so little, uh, and, and part of the, uh, you know, the even further uh, tax breaks to the super rich that happened under Bush. I, I mean, this is a great deal of the problem that's happening now with the budget. Yeah, it was the budget before Obama got in that uh, created all the uh, deficits, and now we need to, we have been building up, I mean, there has been an increase in jobs, there has been an improvement uh, since uh, 2008, but it's, it's very slow. And yeah, not exactly. Enough. Cor corporate taxes are, are really um, very low compared to ordinary people's taxes, but the worst thing is that by cutting things, um, for example, cutting, uh, getting rid of school teachers and getting rid of firefighters and all the people in the that make the cities work, you're also getting rid of the purchasing power of the people who would be fueling the economy and buying things to make the economy grow. So uh, it's uh, totally counterproductive to uh, be. leading very quickly. I mean, when you look at what was done, for example, and continues to be done in Greece, in Spain. There's a run of the banks on the Greece now, right? The ATM is that works. But, but, you know, by one act of, of an order from the, from the European bankers or the German bankers, wages are cut by 40%. I mean, pensions are just stolen. Uh, Bank deposits just emptied out. You know, these are the policies now that come from the top bankers in Europe. And this is, all of that you could say is being tested on will they be able to do the same thing here? I mean, what are their plans for Social Security? They want to rob it, they want to privatize it, turn it over I mean, to the It's sort of a 20-year plan uh, on the part of the right wing and the Republicans to um, Starve the beast yeah. to get rid of social security or privatize it, and which would in effect get rid of it. Well, the pension plan of um, state and city workers, for example, across the country, that was just used as a play money by a lot of corporations invested in the stock market. And things are going down. Public money was thrown into it. And or when you look at what's happened to the city of Detroit. The yeah. uh, city's absolutely bankrupted, and uh, and, and, and there's no there at all. Right, it's been it's a whole city put into receivership. Right. I had another question about um, about uh, Technion. Technion. Yeah. Yeah. Because
because there was an article that came out a couple of weeks ago about how the Israelis were actually working in Peru. And I just I wonder, I mean, it's, you mentioned, you talked as if the drones were just going to be used against the Palestinians, because I think that the drones actually, if, if, they, if the Israelis are perfecting their drone capacity at the behest of uh, Mayor Bloomberg, which is, <laughs> sounds so horrible. <laughs> but the, if that, I could Google. see that also being used in Peru and wherever the Israelis no. are training them. 